Right. Um, first of all, um, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I know these are trying times, but it's um, very nice to be able to have this opportunity to speak to all of you today um, about this work that I'm quite excited about. So um, uh, thanks for coming. And thanks to Carl and Jen for having me. Um, so today I'll be talking a bit about this um, work which I did in the uh, maths department at the University of Nottingham. And uh, all right. So before I get stuck in, um, let's talk a bit about the motivation. Um, so first of all, the looking for synchrony is sort of the, the bread and butter, I guess, of a lot of, of, of neuro uh, mathematical neuroscientists. You know, right from the beginning, in terms of the Kuramoto model, it was always, um, you know, under what conditions can a system synchronize or or desynchronize? Um, and well, there's been a lot of work done on those sorts of systems, and typically, or they often require specific networks. So in in the Kuramoto model, you have uh, all to all coupling. And then in other situations, people analyze systems like rings where you're connected to your nearest neighbor. Um, but the sort of techniques we, we were working on, we wanted to be able to generalize those to arbitrary network structures. And so what we ended up using was the uh, master stability function. Um, now, it's, this is a talk about um, network dynamical systems. So uh, I'm going to assume that everyone is reasonably familiar with, with some of the things I'm talking about. And I apologize in advance if if it's um, if I skip over too many things, um, so what it is is that it's a useful approach for looking at the stability of networks of dynamical systems. Um, you start with your synchronization manifold, which, if your network is balanced, is guaranteed to exist. Then you have a, a variational equation, so with the stabili linear stability analysis around your synchronization manifold, and then the the, the trick is that you block diagonalize it according to the eigenvectors of the network coupling matrix. And now you then you're able to sort of decouple the system and reduce it to individual problems. Um, so that, that's all a bunch of text and it's easier to sort of uh, visualize it and go through it step by step. So let's say you have a network where each node is a dynamical system, say x dot is equal to f of x. Um, and then now if you have n nodes, then in general, you're gonna have n times n coupled differential equations. I mean, you can do stability analysis on that, but that's gonna be very difficult in general for large dimensional systems. Um, but what this, this method does is that you have information about the structure of the system in that each block of n differential equations is essentially the same apart from the network coupling. So you can write each of the, um, x dots as its own f of x minus some term that you get from the network. Um, so if we think about how we can do single node perturbation analysis, what you do is that for around some limit cycle um, s of t, you just have to find the Jacobian where this is time, time dependent and periodic. Um, and then you can use Floch theory to tell you about whether the limit cycle is stable or unstable. Um, now, as a, as a side note, we're going to focus on piecewise linear systems here because what it allows you to do is, is to calculate your Jacobian matrices um, explicitly. I mean, you can do it for, for nonlinear systems as well. It's just that um, you have to resort to numerical calculations at an earlier stage in the analysis. Um, but, you know, there are a lot, there's a long history of um, using piecewise linear models to um, represent more complicated nonlinear models, and you of, you're often able to get qualitatively uh, the same behavior. Um, so, for example, the, the Fitzhugh Nagumo model um, in certain parameter regimes is well caricatured by the McKee model, where you've just replaced this um, cubic null climb with a three part piecewise linear null climb. Um, so, going back to the, the full n, n by m dimensional structure, you get this, this block structure now if you, if you write down the um, variational equation and then you use the, um, and then you use the um, graph, the eigen spectrum of the network matrix in order to 
decompose this into just block matrices. And now because these are block, mat block diagonal matrices, you can just decompose each one of them. So essentially for each eigenmode, you're only left with um, a low dimensional problem. And you can work out the stability for these things independently, which is much easier than doing the full n by m dimensional problem. Um, so essential, and, and even better than that, what we can do is that in advance, we can look at what eigen, uh, what network values um, beta will, will result in a stability problem that gives you sta stable or unstable behavior. Um, so, for example, in, um, for a network of piecewise linear integrate and fire neurons, um, they found this sort of uh, Pac-Man shaped region of stability. And then they were just able to, to choose different network structures that would, um, that would be inside the region of stability, like in the middle figure, or outside the region of stability, like in the left and right figures. Um, and in fact, if you're only looking at the bifurcation point where only one um, eigenmode leaves the region of stability, that eigenmode will tell you about the pattern of behavior that you're going to observe in the network structure. So uh, this is a, an example we worked on where, um, so previously we looked, uh, the previous example was where each node was a piecewise linear integrate and fire neuron. Uh, this one is now each node is going to be a population of, of neurons um, following the Wilson Cowan model. Um, and then, so typically there are sigmoid coupling functions in, the, in this network, and then we're, we're just going to replace that with a, a piecewise linear um, function, but um, it qualitatively replicates the same sort of behavior. And then now, sort of, uh, you get a non dimensionalized version of it here. And then we get this uh, horrible stability expression for the operator uh, in terms of these eight matrix exponentials. But because each of these matrices is now constant, it's much, it's, uh, you can actually do everything analytically. So uh, that, that's why we've chosen this particular form for the model. And then what we do, as I, I mentioned before, is that we can find a point where just only one eigenvalue of the network has um, caused the stability problem to have an eigenvalue, which is uh, more than one. And then the corresponding network eigenvalue, in fact, predicts the shape of the instability that we see in the network. So on the right, we have, we've got this um, um, graph of the um, network eigenvector. And then we've got the space-time plot showing how the instability manifests. Um, right. Yeah, so it, it's a bit confusing because there's the eigenvalues of the of the network itself, which then go into the problem, and then they t and then there's the eigenvalues of the stability operator, which you calculate based on that, and that's the one which tells you whether or not it's stable or unstable. Um, and then there there are a bunch of extensions of this mass stability type analysis. So before, what we've been doing was that we've been taking the sort of um, synchronous a manifold to linearize around so where where every node essentially follows the same behavior but if you it's, it's a bit more bookkeeping but you can also write well write down the state where say half the networks are following one trajectory x1 and then the other half are following another trajectory x2 and so you've got two clusters of uh, um of um neurons in your network and and that's what they've done here so they, they did some computational group theory to find out the possible uh, cluster states. And then for each of those cluster states, they com computed the regions of stability. And they've come up with this huge bifurcation diagram showing how as you value um, one of the parameters, you get different cluster states appearing and disappearing, and even some aperiodic behavior as well. So it, it's a pretty uh, flexible approach. And, and other people have worked on different types of extensions to it. For example, you can put in time delays uh, and then you get these horrible transcendental equations with, uh, um, but you, but it's uh, essentially the, the same once you've taken care of the additional terms. And you can also do things like use nearly identical oscillators instead of exactly identical oscillators. Um, 
So yeah. <clears throat> um, and but what I'm going to be talking about today in a bit more detail is uh, actually replacing the idea of a network with with um the n goes to infinity limit. So you know, a lot of the a lot of times there's been um, recent work on studying the limit of of a network. So you, what happens um, when you have more and more nodes? You ultimately want to be able to study some sort of continuous version of it, right? I mean, because that that's what we do in population or field models in neuroscience. You don't want to have to study each of the millions of neurons connected together. You want to be able to write down some large scale quantities for this. And, and one way of thinking about these for networks is to um, study what's called a, a graphon. So um, there's quite a lot of uh, involved mathematics in it, but luckily people have already proven that it behaves as you would think um, for most well-behaved systems. So what you can look at in the <clears throat> bottom right figure here is that you have some network which you can write down, which you can draw an adjacency matrix of basically as a, a raster of pixels. And then you can say, well, um, if the number of nodes n goes to infinity, what sort of random generated function would have led to these sorts of pixel patterns? And for a lot of types of random networks, you can write down a well-behaved function that will generate these networks for different values of n. Um, <clears throat> and, and if you think about the um, how PDEs are solved numerically, one of the most basic ways is to discretize your PDE, in which case it essentially becomes a large network of ODEs. So there is a fundamental connection in, in, in some cases between these theories, and that, that's what I'm going to explore here. So instead of diagonalizing the graph Laplacian matrix, which I've talked about previously, you just diagonalize an integral operator, but the rest of the formalism remains exactly the same. Um, you know, if you just think about having an infinite dimensional block matrix, but each block is going to be um, the same number of dimensions as it was before. So what I've done here is that I've taken the, um, the same piecewise linear integral and fire model that I talked about as one of the examples previously. And now I've put it as a continuum on a ring between minus pi and pi. And now instead of um, a, you know, a fixed number of eigenvectors for the network, what I've got is uh, an infinite number of, of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But um, you know, by choosing different coupling functions, again, you can just get the same results that you did before, that you, sometimes you get stability and then you can vary it and you can get different forms of stability. So what we're seeing here is um, different eigen vectors, well, the eigen functions now, which have escaped the region of stability and caused these patterns now in a continuous media instead of a discrete network. Um, and now that we've established this formalism, we're no longer bound to operators which have arisen as a result of a network. So we can just think of arbitrary operators in PDEs, and we can do this same sort of um, linear stability analysis and uh, spectral combined with a spectral method, which will then tell us about the different regions of stability and what sort of instabilities you can expect. So for example, what I've done here is I've looked at a, a very common um, reaction diffusion model, the brusillator, and I've put it on a torus. Um, so the unit square with periodic boundary conditions and just use the standard diffusion operator. Um, now this has uh, well-known eigenvalues and, and eigenvectors depending on the um, boundary conditions. And what we're able to do is, is use this MSF method um, and we can predict exactly where as you increase this parameter, which is diffusion strength, you go from um, this pattern on the left, which is uh, a period two pattern in the X and Y dimensions. And then you get a region of stability and then you get a period one pattern on the right. Um, 
And then what we've also applied, besides those which were kind of toy problems, we've also applied this to a sort of a much more detailed neural field model recently. Um, what it is, it's a, a rebound, a model for a rebound current in a neural field. And so the, the basic equation is in the middle here. Um, you have your voltage, which is, which is just as, uh, affected by the three different types of currents that we're looking at. One is your very simple conductance-based ion channel L. And then there's also this hyperpolarization activated channel T. Um, and that's controlled by a gating variable, which I'll go into a bit more detail in a second. And also we have a synaptic current, which tells you about the, the, the spatial coupling um, uh, U. And you've got a second order synapse Q, there's an alpha synapse. And then you have this spatial convolution phi, um, which is uh, W, which is just telling you about some spatial function multiplied by the convolved with the firing rate of the of the neural neural field so essentially when one one neuron fires it affects the um its neighbors according to your spatial function w uh, so um oh, sorry this this is the this is the synchronous orbit in the system um and it's a, it's a bit hard to plot four dimensional things so um in sort of the VH di um, dimension, that's the bottom right. And then across one cycle, um, one sort of fire re rebound cycle is, is these top two diagrams. And what happens is that when, when V is, your voltage V is below some voltage VH, it increases this H variable, which is what causes the rebound current. And then when you have, when you're above your voltage threshold, then you fire and then you affect the other areas according to your spatial kernel. But there's a gap between this uh, VH below which you get the rebound current and uh, V threshold with which you fire. And what, what that leads to is a sort of um, a gap between uh, areas of activity. Um, and these cause what, what we've called uh, lurching waves sometimes. Um, in that, so let's say you start with one area firing and then its neighbors are, are suppressed. Um, but the areas be a, a, away from that get hyperpolarized. And so when, when the first area stops firing, then those areas start, start um, firing themselves with this gap in the middle. And, and why we're studying this is because it it's, it's, um, generates some really interesting patterns and sort of a new mechanism for generating some of these patterns. So the, these are the sort of gaps and, and lurching waves I was talking about. You start with um, a region of activity into the center, uh, which suppresses the area immediately adjacent to that. But then at some point when the initial area stops firing, then um, the next ring starts firing around that. And so um, the key idea that we're talk going to talk about today is um, to analyze waves as an instability of this spatially homogeneous steady state, which would have been just a synchronous solution in the network context. So because of that, the spatial convolution is trivial because you can just put in, um, put in that, uh, a uniform value everywhere and the system reduced to this 4 ODE system. Uh, and as before, we've changed some sigmoid herbicide functions for, for tractability. Um, so we just have these four, four ODEs which we can solve to get this uh, synchronous periodic solution. And then now we're going to consider the effect of the spatial coupling as perturbations to the synchronous orbit of this form, um, which is very common in, in uh, wave analysis. And then the spectral decomposition of, it, this, of the coupling uh, is obtained via Fourier decomposition. Um, and then we just get this stability operator phi by piecing together the Jacobians in the four different regions that we're talking about. Um, because there's sort of discontinuities, we have some extra matrices K that you, that you have to calculate. Um, and I won't really go into um, that today because for time reasons, but it's uh, when, once you've got those, then it's just um, multiplying a bunch of matrices together, uh, which is fairly simple. And then for the kth eigen mode of the spatial coupling, you can compute the stability operator and its corresponding eigenvalues. 
and so this and and then the system is stable if they're all inside the unit disk and unstable otherwise. So what we're seeing here is that for the um, spatial kernel um, that we chose for the system W, we get its Fourier representation W hat, uh, and then we co compute for the corresponding things to k equals zero, k equals one. Uh, we can compute the um, stability operator and see what its maximum eigenvalue is. So in this case, we see that for k equals two and k equals three, that we, we get uh, instabilities in the system. And that's exactly what we see. The synchronous solution is destabilized, which leads to traveling waves. Um, and, and in this sort of neural field context, um, I think this uh, MSF approach is a useful bridge between your fixed point analysis, where you just have the fixed point of everything being zero, um, and your full sort of traveling wave analysis in a co-moving frame. Um, it allows you to find sort of an additional Read behavior in the middle because sometimes you you can't always get your uh, wave solutions directly as an instability of your fixed point solutions and and sort of the um, really exciting part to me is that you can uh, reverse engineer um, different spatial couplings if you want to look for different bifurcations you don't have to do uh, numerical parameter sweeps you just say well I know that a bifurcation happens if I put in this eigenvalue. So then you can say, well, what kind of spatial kernels give me this eigenvalue? Um, and, and that just allows you to study a, a wide range of dynamic behavior really easily. Um, and so um, in terms of, of future work, uh, I'd like to look at how exotic the operators you put in can be. So I've, I've got some preliminary work on fractional diffusion, which uh, indicates that it, it does work. Um, you, instead of having a spatial operator, now you've got a partly time, partly spatial operator. Um, and, and there's some sort of quite gnarly pure maths that you have to work out to make sure everything is um, correct. But I, um, I, we've, I've got some promising preliminary results there. And I've, since, since this work, I've now moved on to a, a different project, which is a sort of more data-driven project on how you can use both um, functional and diffusion MRI data uh, in order to give you a better picture of uh, underlying brain networks. And, um, but the sort of next step from that would be to look at the effects of parcellation on networks. So um, when you infer these sort of uh, node population level networks where you represent the brain with say 100 nodes, you know, from your MRI data, which are based on millions of voxels, uh, you have to choose some uh, labeling of nodes in between to draw some regions around different bits. And a lot of these are uh, functional, you know, and they're known based on known parts of the brain which do different things. But some of them, for example, do you want 100 nodes, do you want 200 nodes, do you want 300 nodes, are simply a, a choice uh, based on, on convenience. And, and there have been studies which show that the effect of parcellation on your um, analysis, there, there is a big effect, um, but they still don't know exactly how this effect works or, or in, does it inform you about the best way to choose the network? So that, that's a big open question, which, which uh, I think this could be applied to. Uh, and another area is uh, stochastic block modeling which is sort of, uh, you get these uh, random generative model for networks with community structure. And, and these sort of uh, random generative uh, communities are, are essentially a natural fit for this kind of uh, graphon style modeling. Um, that's it. Uh, thanks again for uh, listening. Lovely, thank you very much, Yiming. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Louis, hi. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. Great evening. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. It was very nice. Nice extension into uh, continuous systems. Uh, Thank you. I haven't seen that before, but that, I like that. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, one is that um, I would think that I'm not a neuroscientist, but I would think that the Laplacian coupling probably wouldn't 
uh, apply to neuron systems. I don't know. People more knowledgeable could talk about that. But I think uh, in, in the case of neurons from the little I've seen and some of the people I've talked to, I think the cluster analysis you just briefly mentioned might be a more applicable tool, although it's a you know false group theory and all that. But it does, uh, I think you don't need a Laplacian structure to do that. So for, I would think for a neuron or neuroscience application, that might be the better way to go. Uh, the other thing is that I think you have to be careful about the, uh, the loss of the synchronization. It does generate a pattern initially, but that's just near the synchronous manifold. Where that system goes later could be in the base of another attractor that doesn't look like that pattern at all. So I don't want people to get the idea that once you lose the synchronization, that pattern is always there. It's, sometimes it's not. It, it depends on the system. But overall, I, I like what I saw. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, you, you're right. It is only um, the pattern which, which um, arises just after the bifurcation. Um, and, and you can't predict what happens later because it's ultimately based on a linear stability analysis. Um, and as for the, the Laplacian coupling, that, that, that's very true. Um, I, I didn't go into too much of the details, but in the, um, in the case study that I showed, we didn't actually have Laplacian coupling, but we had a sort of balanced coupling. So we just put a, you put a row sum term, essentially a normalization term into the, the ODEs, and then it, you can still do the, the analysis in a similar way, just more, um, slightly more bookkeeping. Ah, okay. Thank you.